then let's start. Okay, this is a um, small introduction to Vim for an already productive programmer. So I um, expect everyone here to have a little bit of knowledge of how IDEs work, how normal editors work. Um, yeah, so the content we're going to go through today is first a little bit of history and the philosophy, obviously, like what is Vim, where does it come from? Um, then we need to go through a few basic commands because Vim is actually quite different than most other editors. Um, then comes the tricky part. We're going to set up a live uh, Go IDE kind of Vim uh, environment so that you can, I hope it does not take longer than 10 minutes to set this up uh, afterwards, uh, productively program in Go, Go language. Um, afterwards, I'm going to give you a small opinionated starter config. It just changes a lot of common commands that are kind of uh, cumbersome to type uh, to some, uh, yeah, map them to different commands. And um, then I'm going to explain again why I gave this talk, why I think this is important for um, us and for context, everyone who sees this, we are Solidity auditors. So um, uh, why, why do I want everyone to know about Vim and even use Vim in at least some context? And yeah, let's start with the history and a little bit of the philosophy. So if we check out uh, Vim's homepage, vim.org, it states that uh, Vim is a highly configurable text editor built to make, make creating and changing any kind of text very efficient. Um, I underlined here two different words. One of them is that it's a text editor. So it's not actually um, a programming editor. It's not like IntelliJ or um, VS Studio Code. It's there you can use it for every kind of text processing. And um, the second thing is that I underlined is changing any kind of text, very efficient. So if we think about us as software engineers, most of the time we're actually not creating code. Most of the time we are uh, transforming existing code to a different representation. We call this refactoring, rewriting, making it, making it more performant. Performant means in the end, uh, not writing the whole code again, but changing specific parts of the code. Same as with auditing, if we see security issues, we do not delete everything and write it again. We just change single points inside of the text. Um, so Vim itself is uh, not the original version. Uh, originally, there was the uh, VI editor. Uh, this is back from the um, Unix, very first Unix days. And uh, Vim itself is standing for VI improved. So it's a new version building upon of VI and um, made it a little bit more modern. Even though it was released in 1991, it's still um, one of the most used programming environments worldwide. You can check here this Stack Overflow survey from 2019. And we see that Vim is still on number five. So a quarter, at least from the Stack Overflow participants here, a quarter of all software engineers use Vim. And what's a little bit interesting, if we check here, for example, mobile developers, we see that Vim is a lot farther down the line because yeah, mobile is kind of a specific environment and there you want to have a lot of tools included. But if we check out uh, DevOps, we see that nearly 40, a little bit more than 40% of them are using v Vim. Um, and I guess this is because Vim is really good to have inside of the terminal and to use inside of the terminal. And with DevOps stuff, you need um, a lot of, have a lot of terminal integrations, a lot of terminal touching points. Um, nowadays, there are a lot more new Vim versions. I would say the most prominent one is Neo Vim or also called NVim. Um, it supports like why it's cooler is because you can write plugins in Lua. Lua is some kind of scripting language. However, it's totally backwards compatible. So if you, after this talk, decide, okay, I want to try out Vim, I would suggest to actually install NeoVim. It's the same thing, just a little bit modern, cooler. And you can add these two commands into your bash RC or status H RC and can just totally forget that you use NeoVim. You just use Vim, it's the same thing. Um, and now we come to the philosophy, which I'm going to mention a few times in this talk. So um, actually, if we think about software engineering or any kind of text writing, text processing, doesn't matter if you write a paper or write a novel or if you're going to write some um, big software project, it's actually that we think about what we write more than 90% of the time. At most 10% of the time, we're actually using our keyboard to write in some new characters. 
And um, this is one of the um, insights the VI or Vim creators had. And um, it's a really uh, deep insight kind of, because it means if we use our keyboard, the whole, um, if we have our keyboard, why can we only use it less than 10% of the time? Because we can type with the keyboard and we only use it less than 10% of the time. So if we take the following assumption that a programmer wants to use the keyboard as much as possible. Um, why does a programmer wants to use the keyboard as much as possible? Because every time we switch to the mouse, we have, first of the time, it costs a lot of time. You have to move your arm. And uh, second of all, it has some cognitive overhead. The whole um, movement is different. We are now with, uh, with our cursor here in this part. And this is also the part of code we are currently thinking about. And if we take the mouse, it could be anywhere on the uh, screen, and we are suddenly in a totally different corner of the mouse. So it always has some cognitive overhead. And now the question arises, if we only want to use the keyboard, and why less than 10% of the time actually use the keyboard to write it, why do we not optimize the keyboard for reading text and for moving inside of text while we read it? And um, this is a question that the VI or Vim creators had. And um, their idea to solve this problem was to um, develop different modes inside of the editor. And uh, we're going to define two different modes in this um, presentation. The one is the mode in which we write, and the other one is the mode in which we read. And obviously, the writing mode is used less than 10% of the time, while the reading mode is used more than 90% of the time. And um, yeah, this is said here again. So the mode in which we write, we call it insert mode. In Vim it's called insert mode because we actually insert new characters into our file. And um, the mode in which we read is the normal mode because we are in the more than 90% of the time. So it's kind of the normal mode in which we are. And this mode is optimized for reading code or text, for moving through code and text, for jumping around, checking definitions and stuff, and also for transforming existing text. And um, the nice thing is, or really um, productivity enhancer, is that we can now, while we're in normal mode, use the whole keyboard for any kind of commands. If you, for example, use uh, IntelliJ or Visual Studio Code as the normal editor, then um, nearly the whole keyboard you use is already reserved for typing in characters. And if you want to have some shortcuts, you need to press Control or Command R or Z or something like this. You cannot use the whole keyboard um, directly to move around the text. Um, the other thing I want to point out is the part of transforming existing text. So let's take an example. In Solidity, we can define constants, and the really uh, a constant that we nearly have in every kind of code is called BPS for basis points. And as good auditors or good Solidity programmers, we directly see okay, constant BPS, it should be written in uppercase. So there now, two different kinds of way how, ways how we can achieve this transforming into uppercase. And the way we think about it is we want to transform it into uppercase. So this is actually what we could do. We go, could go on BPS on this um, characters. We could mark them and transform them into uppercase. This is the cognitive exercise that we want to do. But most of the time, we're actually not doing it. Most of the time, we're going into the code, into this BPS part of the code delete the uh, characters and rewrite them in uppercase. And this is a lot more, um, first of all, it has a lot bigger cognitive overhead. And on the other side, it's also a lot more error prone. Like you could, read, you could uh, make mistake while you type it. It takes more time. You have, to, you have to do the initial task that you want to do, want to transform the BPS into uppercase. It's a different task than what you have to do inside the editor. What you have to do inside the editor is deleting the current BPS and writing it again in, uh, in the uppercase BPS. And um, now something which a lot of Vim talks are concentrated on this part, and it is a really um, special thing about Vim, a really powerful. All of us are programmers. So um, why don't we use all of these commands that we now have inside of the keyboard while we are in normal mode to actually concat them together to more powerful commands? Um, I'm going to go more deeply into this uh, commands here, but just as an example, with J, if you press J while you're in normal mode, 
you move one line down. It's kind of like the arrow key. You just move one line down. And uh, now we can concat this command with, for example, a five. And if I would press five and then J, then I would jump directly five lines down. So we can concat individual commands together. The same with the D command. Uh, D means something with delete, um, but we don't know what to delete yet. And with W, we can move one word farther. So for example, now we are with the cursor here at the beginning of move here. And if we would press W inside of Vim, we would jump directly here to the beginning of the next move. And we can concat these two commands. You could press D for delete and then W for word. And what this would do would directly all delete directly all of this stuff in just two keystrokes. We can delete any word. Uh, doesn't matter the size. Uh, yeah, question? Uh, is this in, in in writing or in reading mode? This is in the reading mode, because if you're in uh, the writing mode, the insert mode, if you press a D, you would actually write the character D. But um, I'm going to show exactly that now. So give me one more moment. Now we come to the basic commands. And there are a lot of them, but don't feel frightened now or anything. It really, uh, you don't need to know all of them. No one knows all of them. And you become productive really fast. I added here into the notion a cheat sheet with just the most common ones. And um, now we're going to go through some of them. So um, if you open Vim, this is now the normal installed Vim, which is shipped in every macOS version. There are no plugins, nothing is changed. I open it and we see, okay, it's pretty blank. Um, this tilde lines here on the left just means that uh, there's nothing inside yet. So this lines do not exist yet. If I press a few times enter, then uh, you see this tilde moves away. And um, we see there's nothing really on the screen. If I now go into the insert mode, then we see on the lower left corner here, uh, here um, there's an indication that we now left the normal mode and we are now in the insert mode. And now I can, if I now press some keys, we can actually write. And if I go out of the insert mode again with escape, then I can uh, move around inside of the keys with my normal keyboard. So now I, for example, press L to move one to the right, the same as an arrow key. And it's, yeah, I can move around. If I press E again, now I press L, then I actually write it. And um, let's check out, voila. of course there are problems now. So um, let's check out here just to show some examples. This is the normal ERC20 code from uh, Open Zeppelin. I copied it, it's just some text file basically. There's no syntax highlighting yet or anything else because it's a bare bone Vim without any special plugins. And here we have the four most important commands while we are in the normal mode. Um, this is H, J, K and, K, and L. And these are the arrow keys. So with A, J, I can go down. With K, I can go up. With L to the right and with H to the left. And this is really um, fortunate that these are the four keys because if we use 10 finger typing, we have our four main fingers anyway, always on the H, J, K, K L keys. So uh, we have our fingers there the whole time anyway. The moving around is the normal um, thing that we, the, the most easy uh, keys to accept while we just touch our keyboard. Um, with E, we can go into the insert mode. Now we can type stuff. And with escape, we leave the insert mode again. So now I cannot type things. Now I can just read things. Um, to jump to the start of the file and to the end of the file happens with G. So with, for example, uppercase G, we jump to the end of the file. With two times lowercase G, we jump to the beginning of the file. Um, if we have a double colon, we see it appears here in the lower left corner. We can type in any kind of command or just a line number, for example, 100. And now I jump to the uh, line 100. And um, some things how we can move more easily in the text are, for example, W and B, with which we go one word farther. We always jump one word. Or with B, we jump one word back. And uh, with now we can come to this concatenation of commands with um, 
D, which stands for any kind of delete, we can uh, concat this with different commands. So for example, W is jumping one word forward. If I now press D and then W, I can delete the whole word. Um, the most important command that you should know is the WH command. It opens um, the help files, which are in Vim directly accessible. And Vim is really famous for the help command. So it really makes sense to check it out from time to time. And I press here WH. And I don't have any idea what this help commands are. So I just check the help page for help. And now we see there's some uh, text opening up here, which uh, explains me that um, this is read only. So I cannot actually um, go into insert mode here. I can just read this text and I can uh, further read any kind of stuff about them. We also see something that this green split it here. We kind of have now two different uh, window panels and I cannot use the mouse to jump between them. So um, this happens with control W and then the arrow keys again. Then I can jump between them and we can obviously also uh, split our screens as we want. If we do the double colon, so command interface, and then we press and split, then we can split the screen horizontally. If we do V split for vertical split, then we can vertically split the screen. And we can jump around to all of this without using any mouse. Um, but we are also going to um, make some shortcuts for all of this piece so that we do not actually have to type them anymore. Um, now to the three most important commands, I guess, really most important ones is W is the colon W command that's uh, to write. So we actually save the file. Now it's written, it's saved. And the one where a lot of people seem to have problems with is how to exit them. This happens with WQ. Quit. Um, if this doesn't work, sometimes it does not work. For example, if I now delete here something and I want to press Q, then it uh, is angry because we uh, did not save our last uh, changes. If you don't want to save them, you can press uh, go with Q exclamation mark. So then we can leave the um, window, uh, the file without having to have saved it. Um, I would suggest if you start out with them, just copy one of the sheet, sheets here, print them out, hang them above your uh, desk, start to use it a little bit. And as long as you know H, J, K, L, and how to go into insert mode and leave the insert mode, you are totally fine to go and everything else will develop from there. Um, and now we're going to uh, show past how to set up a Go IDE. So the Go programming language, Go. Um, first of all, we need to know, we need to configure Vim something, Vim somewhere. And we read online that there's something like a Vim RC script, but okay, no idea what that is. So um, let's just go into our home directory. We open Vim. We, put, we read about this vimrc file. We have no idea about it. So we go into the help page. And uh, we see here it's uh, a file that's loaded at the, at the initialization of Vim. It's called vimrc file. OK, cool. And um, here we see where it is saved normally. And on Unix system, which is Linux, BSD, or Mac, or even more stuff, uh, we see it should be in the home directory and is named .vimrc. So that was easy enough. Let's just create that file, vimrc. Um, let's check if it's really there. So we uh, print everything that's in my home directory and grab only the things that have vim inside. And we see, OK, the vimrc file got created. But at the moment, it's, of course, empty. There's nothing inside. Um, the first thing that you need nowadays is then, of course, some kind of plugin manager you want to install. You don't want to write all the stuff yourself. So um, one of the most famous plugin managers is Vimplug. And it's really as easy to install and to use as possible. Um, so we go to the readme. We see here, ah, OK, Unix. It, uh, here's the Unix uh, command to install it. It, in the end, just downloads, seems to download one file called plug.vim. And it creates it um, in some .vim autoload directory. So this seems fine. We just copy it. Um, ah, yeah, 
we go back to our uh, terminal. Okay, cool. Um, see, seems to be installed. And now it's set um, here inside of the example that we, where we want to define our plugins that we want to install, we have to call, put in this command here, call plug begin, and at the end call plug end. So we can just start to um, add this to our um, Vim RC. I'm going to copy this here. Dom, it's inside. Uh, we delete this. And now we uh, can insert our plugins that we want inside of this code part here. And uh, this double, I'm not sure how this stuff is called in English actually, the Gänse, the Abostros. Um, this is a comment. So this insert plugin here is, uh, doesn't do anything. And um, now we wanted to do a Go thing. And of course we are cool modern programmers. So we want to use the language server protocol. Um, we are going to install the most common plugin there. And we see, okay, it's just one line. We just call plug and then uh, the name of the GitHub user and the name of the project. So um, this seems really easy. Um, this just install LSP client, so language server protocol client. And uh, now we need to install it. So we can uh, call the uh, plug plugin install command um, after I restarted them. So we call plugin install and it now downloaded the Vim LSP. 100% was really fast, seems to be done. Okay, but this LSP client itself uh, does not bring us anything yet. We need some kind of Go language server or some kind and some kind of Go plugin. Uh, for this, we install Vim Go. It's also the most famous Go plugin. Uh, we go through the install. We use Vim plug. Okay, it's again just one line. We copy it. Um, insert it into our into our Vim RC, and again try to install it. We first need to restart Vim because um, it does not reload the Vim file autom the Vim RC file automatically. So now it also installed Vim Go. And we can start to check it out. We are here in a, a Go project, C for audit, C audit. Um, it's a project that we developed at ByteRocket. And um, let's just open the Go file. So we have vim.go, we have an... I think you removed a call from the vimrc on accident. I removed a call from the vimrc, damn it. I think in the last line there is plug end in recent, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, now it's starting without any problems. Um, okay, then let's open the Vim file. We see, oh cool, we got some kind of uh, color support for our code. It, maybe not the most beautiful one, but at least there's something. And um, if we press in Go, we also see, okay, we got a lot of Go commands, which are now suddenly here. We can tap through them with tap. And now let's just try to build our uh, project that we here have. And yeah, we successfully compiled it. There are no compile errors. That's pretty cool. Um, we can also, if we press uppercase K, then we can open documentation. So now I press K and we see here it opened a different, it split the screen again, opened a different um, panel. And here we see the uh, documentation from the uh, flag.pass function. And um, this was a function now from the standard library from Go, but we can also check out functions. This is a function that we wrote ourselves. It has documentation too. So we see, okay, we can easily um, read documentation from everything. Um, one part that every, at least modern programmer always wants to have is some kind of uh, um, auto completion. So for example, now we press flag and we want to see all the functions that are inside of this package. We want to have some kind of Auto completion. And this is built in in Vim. We just need to press um, 
one command, which I'm not going to show you because I'm going to show you directly a shortcut for that in a minute. But we directly see, okay, we have auto completion. These are all the um, all the functions that are defined in this package. And we also on the upper part here have directly our um, our documentation to it. So we are nearly already at the normal uh, IDE feeling. And this without having like to download any big IDE or something like this. Um, one thing that a lot of people like, even though I'm not personally not so much a fan of it, is to have this kind of um, highest structure on the left side or on the right side. And uh, there's another plugin for that. Um, also, again, easy to install. Just one line. We take it. We copy it into our Vim RC. We call Vim and say to the plug, plugin manager that we want to install everything. And then we have some kind of nerd tree. Don't know what that is. So um, let's just try help nerd tree. Okay, what is nerd tree? Cool, we directly got some documentation to it. We can actually uh, go through it and it says it has some kind of w colon nerd tree command. So let's try it out. Oh, okay, that was cool. So we directly have here now on the left, the normal file structure that we want to have. We can now, um, if we just close this and we want to open issues, we press, we go on it, press enter, and here we have the new go file open. We can, of course, also split our screen and open here a different file. And we're kind of nearly already at a normal, um, at a normal IDE feeling. We have our auto completion, we have docs on the upper side, everything is still a little bit ugly, but um, this is something we're going to change at least a little bit now. So let's close everything again. And now comes the most important part, which kind of color schemes do you want? Um, I'm personally a big fan of Nord. Nord is some kind of darkish, bluish color scheme. Um, seems easy. We again, just copy this one line of code go into Vim RC, copy it over, call Vim. You can directly with the plus um, say that Vim should start and directly execute this command. So let's do this. It installs it. Let's check how it looks now. Uh, seems like it's not working. Ah, yeah, we need to set this color scheme in our in our config. So we go here and set define this color scheme that we want to use our not color scheme, which we just downloaded. And now it already looks cooler. Yeah, perfect. Um, can split our screen. We have all our file structures here. Um, the license is actually not so important, so that's deleted. That's supported too. We can directly delete it. Everything is already there. You just have to find find it a little bit, have to get used to finding it. Um, but I think that's, yeah, that was most of the stuff that I wanted to show about um, how to build up the IDE. And we see we had the, this language server protocol in case uh, someone don't know it yet. It's a uh, protocol from Microsoft in which um, the static analysis of code is done on some server and um, it sends the whole anal analysis of the code to the editor or to the IDE. Um, and this means that we only need to have Vim LSP installed. It's a client which reads this protocol, which knows this protocol. And we can now easily install Vim Alexia, Vim Erlang, Vim Solidity, and all of them use this language server protocol. So for all different languages, there's a small server running on our system, but Vim itself is still clean. Vim itself does not do the analysis. Um, and now I'm going to go a little bit through an opinionated uh, starter config because some of the commands that we did now were a little bit cumbersome and it just takes time. Um, one thing to mention, but I'm going to go into that a little bit in the next slide is this is the equivalent VS Code um, command commands, the equivalent stuff. 
So this and this are kind of the same thing, just that this is an actual language, it's Vim script, and this is just some JSON VS code configs. And let's copy all of that over, go into our .vim RC and check out what I actually did. Uh, here we set the color scheme already. Okay, so let's add the comment here, remove this lines, do this, and let's check it out. Can, can you read the screen? Is it fine? Or yeah, is it too fine. dark? Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, yeah, our Vim RC is still really lightweight, easy to understand. We have our plugins, plug begin, plug end, and here we just have some Git, um, Git repositories that we added there. We set our color scheme to Nord, which we downloaded here. Um, now we, uh, I told you that I want to do this auto completion a little bit easier. The normal key combination to do that is Control X, Control O. That's a little bit cumbersome, so we now just changed it to Control B. Um, this double colon is not supposed to be there. Um, so what this says here in the end is just map um, this command to this command. So um, instead, like, and it's really just mapping. So if we execute this command, what Vim in the background does, it really just executes this command. So we can build some kind of hierarchy in our um, config too. And this is shown here with the so-called uh, leader button. A leader, the leader is kind of a special key that you can define just to make shortcuts a little bit easier. And um, my opinionated config is that the leader key is on the comma because it's really easy to access from your normal with your normal fingers. Um, we also would like to see some line numbers. So we can just call the command set number and boom, we have line numbers on the left. And instead of um, splitting the screen with this v split command and split command and then pressing enter which is takes quite a long time we just say we want to use the leader key so this is comma and then want to press v and h or vertical and horizontal and if we now open this project again it now reloaded the stuff and i press comma v we have a split if i press comma h we have a different split and i can do this infinite times, no problem, as long as my key, um, as my monitor is big enough. Um, then we also, of course, need to switch between this uh, panels. The normal combination for that is control W and then kind of the arrow keys, so L, H, J, K. But these are two or th like three keystrokes, which is too much. And a lot of times you also switch between uh, the screens really fast without wanting to press new keys. So we just change it directly to control and the arrow key. So here, instead of uh, pressing now control W and J, for example, to go one down and another one down and another one down, we just keep our finger on control and now use this arrow keys, like this J, K, L, H, and move around all the all the planes here. Um, yeah, one thing that you do, well, that you at least should do all the time is to save the file. I kind of do this because in the end we are less than 10% of the time really writing code. We can kind of every time we write code directly save it. So a common thing is to write something, go into escape mode and directly W uh, double colons V, but we can make it a little bit easier by just saying, that we use uh, the leader button, which is comma and V, which is now not working because it did not reload the um, config. So we delete here something, we press comma V, and this is fun. We now got an error message here. Why did we get an error message? Because uh, Vim is automatically now without changing anything, already running Go format on every save. And this is now not um, correctly formatted Go code. Um, so we actually, yeah, now it worked to save it. So yeah, we got uh, Vim uh, go format automatically and we had, I need to make this a little bit bigger because my screen is not that big. If we delete this and try to write it, we see we have here in the error message. And um, let's maybe make some 
uh, a new error message, a second one by just defining some variable that we never use, which you are not allowed to do in Go. So yeah, okay, it doesn't even arrive to the second. What I wanted to show is we can jump into this panel here and press enter and it jumps directly to where the error message occurred. So we, and this is everything of this is out of the box, kind of is just this uh, five lines of config here. Um, yeah, and the last thing is, or the pre-last thing is instead of pressing W colon uh, to exit Vim, we can also say we want to do it with the leader too. So comma Q to exit it. And one thing which I'm personally not using, but I know that a lot of people love it, the escape key is pretty far away. Um, so we can say, instead of pressing escape, we want to press, for example, JJ so to exit the insert mode. So we are now in the insert mode, press two times J. Ah, here, the config is not reloaded. I need to do it here. So uh, I press something and now JJ and we are in the uh, normal mode again. Some people also, instead of using JJ, they like to use JH or JK or KK, stuff like this. So where the key is, where your hands are as fast as possible. And now I guess um, all of you thought, okay, yeah, cool, uh, pretty nice and everything, but um, I mean, uh, I like to use IntelliJ or Goland and there are absolute uh, rational reasons to do this. I like to use PS code, which we are using here and we have valid reasons to do it because there are a lot of plugins that Vim does not have, but the Studio code has that we need. And Emacs is also still a thing that a lot of people love and it's a really powerful operating systems. Um, so why did I show you all, now all of this? Um, for me personally, I see Vim as uh, two separate things. In, like if you say Vim. So first of all, there's this editor, the thing that I showed you now, this terminal editor. And uh, the second part is the command and the philosophy. And with philosophy, I mean, in this case, the insight that 90% of the time you're not writing, 90% of the time you're not using your keyboard or you use it with some control command combinations. Um, why don't we use the keyboard 90% of the time or better even 100% of the time? And the nice thing is nearly like Vim is so popular and this philosophy of using your keyboard in uh, the while you're reading code um, got so popular that nearly every editor, I never had an editor which does not have a Vim plugin. For example, in VS Code, you have a Vim plugin. In Emacs, you have the so-called evil mode, uh, Emacs Vim emulator or emulating Vim. Um, if you don't know it historically, Emacs and Vim are kind of, they hate each other because both are really great editors. And um, then IntelliJ also has a Vim plugin. So what I want to tell you is you can actually do I have some kind of, let me just, um, um, show you some solidity code with VS code. So here's now our normal VS code. We have this kind of nerd tree combo uh, pendant here on the left. We have, we can uh, split our screen really easy. But on the other side, we can also have this Vim key with this Vim plugin here on the side, which is now installed on my computer. Um, I cannot type in now anything. I'm in the normal mode. I can go into the normal mode and write something and I can exit it again. And I can, without using the mouse or anything, I can split a screen. I can jump between the uh, panels and I can close them easily. So um, what I want to, uh, what I want you to take away is that if you learn this Vim philosophy and this Vim commands one time, you can take it with you in every editor you go into every program link to program Java, Android. It's based on IntelliJ. It has a plugin. You start to go into Erlang where Emacs is the most famous editor. You can install evil mode. You go into Solidity where there are a lot of great plugins. You install the Vim plugin and you again have all of your normal, um, of your normal workflow. And as I showed you in the other screen, um, you can even take in your normal settings, your normal opinionated configs and 
uh, can copy them to the new editor. Um, another thing is uh, VI or Vim, uh, both of at least one of them is installed in nearly every Linux environment. It's installed in OpenBSD, FreeBSD, always. It's installed on Mac uh, OS X. It's installed on every kind of uh, pop, uh, perpetuate, perpetu uh, software that costs money. It's installed in every kind of operating system, which is based on uh, Unix, which costs money. Like, for example, I have an NAS, a NAS server at home. I SSH into there. It had some Vim installed. And you directly can use it. You learn this command and this philosophy once, and you can reuse it in every uh, editor. And you also become a little bit of a cooler terminal hack hacker because you can easily install your uh, Vim, uh, put in this five plugins that I showed you. And for example, Slither, this is a Solidity static analyzer. It produces a lot of output. And it's sometimes tricky to copy this output into VS Code directly. What you normally have to do is uh, save this output into a file and then open the file in uh, VS Code or in IntelliJ. But um, sometimes you know you don't need this file and afterwards you just need to delete it, but you need to skim through it a little bit more with an editor. Maybe you want to change something just while you open it. And Vim can read from standard, standard in if you append a minus. So um, this is quite easy. If we do here, we check out what's inside, in the, what's inside of the readme. We pipe it. We go with vim minus, and we have, uh, yeah, and we have uh, vim open without having the file saved yet. So we can actually, even if the uh, output is really large and we never want to save it, we can still have it inside of our editor. That's not possible with IntelliJ or with Visual Studio Code that you open text that's not saved in an editor except it's kind of more integrated already into it. And uh, now I want to delete here something and uh, go through all the slither output, but afterwards I do not need it. So I just go with Q and not saving out of it again and became a little bit of a cooler um, terminal hacker. And yeah, that's why I wanted to present this Vim idea. Um, learn it once, use it everywhere. Awesome. Okay. That was. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a lot, and uh, all of those commands, they freak you out in the beginning, but it does not take so much time to become a little bit productive in it, and you start to realize the uh, potential. advantages, potential yeah. and advantages with yeah. us. Yeah. I think it's for a lot of people that probably the first experience with Vim is they are trying to edit a file in the terminal the first time and they Google something and they see V or Vim and then they are spending the next seven days trying to get out of there again. Yeah, um, the, the memes. Yeah, but I think yeah, there is a lot of value in, in learning how, to, how it works, especially if you uh, I mean, there, especially if you force yourself at the same time learning how to 10 finger type, having the fingers on these keys anyways, I think if you can do that, these sort of shortcuts make a lot more sense in comparison to when you just type with one or two fingers. I, I don't, by the way, like I always use Vim stuff, but I don't type 10 fingers. So it's also okay. worth it if you don't, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's worth it in any case, as you said, if, if, even if every IDE has this plugin, you can just learn this once and use it everywhere, which is super cool. Um, regarding VS Code plugin, you would just install the plugin and it uh, basically uses the underlying uh, WinRC structure that you built? No, this, um, you can do this with IntelliJ, that you can directly copy uh, your WinRC file into it. Ah, VS okay. Code is a little bit more um, tricky. You have okay. to do this mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you want to change the Vim plugin and then you can change the leader. But mm -hmm. here's a config to get you started with this, uh, with, which is equivalent to this one. Okay. Yeah, sounds cool. Perfect. Uh, how, did, how did you get into it? 
Um, I actually started with Emacs, which is a different kind of beast. And um, yeah, it's kind of Vim and Emacs are the two most famous old school editors, which are still used nowadays. And um, I just wanted to learn both of them. And then I went from Emacs to this evil mode. And then I yeah, really liked this Vim idea. And Vim is a lot more lightweight than Emacs. So um, I started to use that. And after I realized that you can install it in every other editor in Sublime and VS Code and Notepad++, um, I thought, why should I ever change and learn some kind of control command key shorts, short keys again? So I just stayed with them. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Nano? Is that the newbie version of, of everything? I, I never really used Nano because, uh, yeah, I was into Vim. I'm not sure if Nano has such a big uh, community, developer community, and if you can actually, um, so this, cons this uh, config here, it's called VimScript, and it's a Turing complete language. So you can actually, like one command, for example, like one command that you define can be any kind of program that you run in the background. I'm not sure if Nano, Nano has this kind of capabilities. But I don't know. I probably don't think so. Yeah, I I just remember it as something that you can use if you are kind of scared about them and just want to edit something. People just go the nano way. Yeah, that's true. I yeah. have I have been using um, Helix, which is I think heavily inspired by by Vim and by by NeoVim and by something else as well. It's written in Rust, uh, but at least it has the same kind of um, shortcuts and, and the same key bindings, I think at least. Um, so I even if, if um, I, I think at least there is a lot of different things building on top of it right now. So even if Vim is a bit too hardcore for you, there are things on top with either with the IDE or even some hybrids that still use it, but that look a bit nicer. But uh, I didn't even know that Vim could have this integration with Golang and stuff that was super awesome to see. Um, yeah, as you like what you mentioned with new versions building on top of it, there are a lot of there are also graphical GVim graphical versions of mm. Vim where you can use the mouse. I just then I wanted to show it to uh, put you first into the harder corner. Um, and there is also one Vim uh, rewritten in JavaScript on Node, which is super flashy, new, modern with emojis everywhere and stuff. So um, as soon as you just start to understand the basics, there are a lot of new modern editors that are building upon this commands and philosophy. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I, I imagine that the speed you, you can achieve with, with the like, like automatic search commands and mm -hmm. all that stuff is, is pretty, pretty insane. Like I, I find myself where I'm like, like looking at the at the file and just scrolling up and down because I, I missed missed the file and even if I search it it just is is there like five times and I'm like okay sometimes it's just confusing to use to use the mouse or to rely on on uh, like the visual inputs you have to have to spot these things right yeah yeah totally and what I personally learned after time is this transformation of existing text. So for example, here we have, uh, here we have some like, I don't know, let's make a uh, constant something. And instead of um, deleting this whole text now, I can mark it and go uppercase and just transform it into uppercase instead of what's the normal way of deleting it and writing it again. Um, you do the actual task that you also have in your cognit cognitive uh, brain that you want to do. You want to make it uppercase. You do not want to delete it and rewrite it. And this kind of a transformation of existing text is really powerful too. That comes after mm -hmm. some time. But but that also seems pretty specialized. Like a like you you have to use the function often enough to for it to make sense, right? Like how many times do you have to? Uh, convert a, a low, lowercase uh, word into a high, higher higher case word, right? Like it, it, it of course also um, works if you just have one number. For example, if you start an email with Mr. Felix and then you realize, oh, Felix has written uppercase and Mr. Two, this kind of stuff happens a lot of times, I would say. 
All right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. In, in my head, it was just, okay, you have the whole word and you convert it. But for a single case. You can also use the whole document directly. <laughs> so. Great. Now the repo is done. Um, yeah, but, but, but that's that's a great use case. Like uh, trying to create camel case in some, some uh, variables, for example. Yeah. But, Pretty good. Hmm. Let's change everything back here. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. I think then hmm. we can wrap our first official share Friday up. Thank you very much for the great introduction to Vim as a productive developer, not for everyone. <laughs> but yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>